granular media simulations on the graphical processor unit. So what's the graphical processor unit, the GPU? Uh, it's what runs your smartphones, it what runs the screens, it's what's given us this picture here, the GPU, as the name suggests, processes graphics. In the world that we live in, graphics is everywhere, everything. So what I'm going to speak a bit on is particle transport. So these elements that you saw in that mill are particles. Particles are all around us, sand, salt, everything. We'll speak on, a bit on the GPU. It's the architecture I use for computing. I'll tell you why I use it. A bit on collision detection, which is uh, applicable to many fields. Everywhere we want to know when you collide, when you play a game, when you drive. Uh, then some experimental validation, which is very important. When you do research, you want to know that what you're getting is not just a pretty picture, but it's also correct. Uh, finally, performance, which is the main thing. If you're doing research, you want to be world leading, and we have to compete with everyone on the world scale, and be better than them. And finally, the conclusion. So, okay, the clicker works. Okay, so... Uh, Two descriptions of particle transport in science and engineering. The discrete, where we say everything is made of particles. That's the correct one. Everything in the world is made of particles. Okay? And you have an approximation, which is a continuum approach. Why do we need approximations? Because if I'm going to simulate everything as particles, I'm not going to have enough computing power. It's not feasible. So you have this continuum approach, which approximates reality. So discrete method is physically correct. But it's computationally expensive. Uh, continuing methods are less accurate, and they require some solution of a transport equation, which means you have a lot more physics and mathematics, which is also why I really don't like that. OK, so in summary, discrete solutions, they provide a solution by direct simulation of the physics. It's Newtonian physics. If I take a ball and I drop it, I know how it's going to fall. Newtonian mechanics, simple mechanics, easy for me to understand. Okay. So we simulate the phase space with the actual trajectory of particles in accordance with physical laws. Okay, we don't require coupling of the physics uh, of the system, so it makes it very nice, independent, and parallel. And since here's it, since individual particle simulations are simulated, we can put it in parallel. So the entire world in particles. Okay, you start here with your protons. Okay. They're not the most fundamental particles. It's the quarks that sit inside them that makes this proton. You go on to a slightly larger scale. You get nuclei. Uh, speakers before me were doing molecular dynamic simulations. You come into here, you're on your atomic and your molecular scale. You go a little bit bigger, your granular scale. And since I like things easy, I work on this scale. It's nice and big. I can see it. <laughs> OK? What changes between all of this? It's just the force. The force between these particles are different. You have to have different types of forces. So what it says, I can have a general framework to do any sort of particle simulation, molecular, atomic, nuclear, the rocks. All the changes is the physics between these things. So here, when you go on the small scale, this is in-body simulation. I'll do a simulation a bit later on. Uh, cluster formation. It shows how a galaxy and the Earth formed. Okay? The physical size of the particles is not important. I don't need to know when the millionth particle is colliding with the 10 million particle. I just want to know the approximate area. We're here, where you have granular media. The video showed the interaction is affected by physical contact. So quickly, challenges that we face. Okay, discrete methods are computationally expensive. Thus, they're rather limited in their use. Okay, the approximation to make these methods valid, the most, uh, most basic one is shape. If you have an object like a chair, they'll represent it as a sphere. If you have any other shape, it's a sphere. So when you have a simpler shape, it's much easier to do computational collision detection, less resources. So that's what people do. And they are parallel methods, but you require expensive implementations and clusters uh, to get your solution working. So the GPU, what is the GPU? The set designed to render graphics. Okay? If you look at the screen, I have millions of pixels on this. You look at your smartphone pixel, your smartphones, you have even more pixels. So the GPU, what it does, sorry, it gives you all of these pixels at the same time. So it's like a bus. It wants to get a lot of work done simultaneously. 
If you had a CPU rendered in your graphics on your phone, for example, it's going to loop one by one. So you'll have half a picture, and then you have another half a picture coming. You don't want that. You want it to be done simultaneously. OK? For example, so the NVIDIA Kepler GPU, 4.5 4 teraflops. Let me put this in context. You need a cluster of about 20 PCs, a few hundred thousand rands, to give you the same power that I have in this laptop GPU. And luckily, so graphics card, you think it's what I want to play games on, right? Fortunately, uh, this computing power is now available uh, from NVIDIA via CUDA. So here, if you, have a, you want to know what's inside your computer, your laptop, your tablet, this is the CPU. Basically, it has arithmetic logic units, is what we're interested in scientific computation. How much of maths? How many operations can I do? Okay? You'll see it has about four cores. You look at the GPU, on the other hand, multiple cores, okay? But you can see very less control. It's like zombies. You can set this off to do one task. If you look on this side here, and the GPU will do exactly that. Any little bit for it to change, whereas the CPU, you want it to run your operating system, run your Facebook, you want to do some calculations, it's general purpose. So when you have tasks or computations, if you can express your work that you're doing, in this format, the GPU wins, okay? The question is, would you want to plow a field with two strong oxen or 1024 chickens? Okay? So, the question of this research, can we go from gaming simulations to physics simulations? Okay? The big question is, everyone says, nowadays, there's no free lunch. Okay? So maybe we can get a breakfast. Okay, so what's different from going from a game? What a game wants to do is visual trickery. You aim to fool the eye, okay? In a scientific simulation, we will give a visually correct solution by simulating the underlying physics or the underlying mechanics on an accurate level, okay? So the first thing is contact detection. Here, gaming crudely approximates contact. If you drive in a car in a game and you go into the wall, you just want to know when you crash. You don't want to know what's the energy lost, what's the damage, what's the impact. Okay? Contact is all a single time step. I will collide with this and we'll come out again. Whereas in computational simulations, multiple time steps. Okay? Uh, gaming, as I said, is qualitative. It estimates visually correct behavior, while physics simulations are quantitative. We get physics, we get results out of it. So collision detection, here's something that's very important. If you look at current methods, they require multiple particles or surfaces. Triangulation of a surface is used in all computational or collision detection methods. Okay. Fortunately, I use ray tracing. It's a new method which I developed. Uh, it's very efficient. It doesn't require this mesh. It says I can see this room and I treat each surface as a surface and a fire array. Because the computer, uh, the GPU can do so many millions of pixels, so much of computing powers, I can fire multiple of these rays to know where I am, what I'm doing. Okay? This basically is the summary of the algorithm. It says, if I fire these rays, there's my surface. If all of them have the same sign, the distance, then I'm not colliding with the surface. If I have positive and negative, I'm colliding with the surface. Uh, another important thing is, this says it's an infinite plane. If the vertex there, it still says, ah, I'm colliding. Uh, I've again formulated another algorithm that tells us whether we're on the surface. So, actually, uh, I bought a whole lot of marbles and plastic seed at the toy shop. So, what we do was simulation here. We want to know, great, we're saying the GPU can do these things, all of these can work. How do you know it's correct? So, multiple colored levels here. So, here is the simulation, here is the experiment. And uh, sometimes I get confused myself. That's why I put different colors. So that's how good the simulation is and how accurate it is. And you can see we match very, very well uh, simulation experiment, which is a good thing. We then look at polyhedral particles. Uh, establish this is the only, well, one of two or three uh, papers in the world where you look at actual shape, polyhedra. And again, we match very, very well. So as I said, the approximation is that you can use spheres to represent shape. Well, here we clearly show with all of the same parameters you cannot. 
So, this research shows that particle shape is influenced and has an effect on simulation. Here you can see when you have polyhedral, so when you, when, when you have salt, if you have any powder and you pour it out and you realize why it does suddenly get stuck, because someone went and approximated it for spherical particles and said this design is the best, when your actual molecules have this shape. So again, here we see these particles completely stop. Uh, further validation, validating on one thing is never ever good enough, you want to do more. So this is a ball mill, a crusher, used in industry, mines, almost every single industry wants to crush something at some point. Okay, be it the CEO or some <laughs> materials, but something gets crushed. And here, we have a visual, uh, we see it's good, but you also want to have a quantitative value. Uh, visually, it's very hard to distinguish. Here we calculate the power drawn. So by changing this design, we have the correct power. We can improve energy efficiency of milling, mining, or any of these processes. Okay, and you see again, very, very good results. So what's the difference in parallel computing? I spoke about this GPU and the CPU. For clarity's sake, almost everyone here assume will be the CPU. If you're running stuff on your computer, it's running on the CPU. So the CPU, as I said, has few cores. It costs a little bit cheaper than the GPU. Uh, but your parallelism is very limited. What you can do on this in parallel computing is old. So after doing some calculations here, you see the GPU is 140, 1,480 times faster. Okay? If you take into account the cost and the power, you get in a speed up about 500 times between the CPU. Okay. So how do we compete on the global scale? Very, very well. Okay. If you look at other authors, the other codes are available internationally. Uh, here's my code, it's called BlazeDem. Uh, number of particles, you can look at the Kandel number. Uh, it says, we're five times faster than anyone else in the world. We're 25% slower than gaming simulations. So going from your game to a scientific simulation, we only lost 25% of efficiency, which shows how good the algorithms are. In terms of polyhedra, the story gets even better. There's only one group in the world, the University of Illinois. Uh, so they can do 5,000 particles. I was at a, a conference in, in the US in Colorado, and the speaker before me went and said, in the next five years, we should see a million particles, and I went and showed them 34 million particles. Okay, so we're 9,000 times faster, 9,000 times faster than the DEM code, and then they went to compete, and they now adapted gaming to their code, so very, very inaccurate, low physics, but I'm still 144 times faster than them. Okay. So why do we need more particles? As I said, here, f right up to, we published a paper this year, simulations were done in 2D. It assumed I can do a 2D simulation, and I can get the correct result. We showed here now, you need to do it in 3D. You need all the particles. Again, summary of some simulations we've done, as I said, silos, ball mills. Again, here, for railway engineering, for civil engineering projects, you can estimate loads, forces, and you can improve things. So, summary, please don't clap when I end here, I have something else, <laughs> okay? So, five times faster than current physics codes, 60 million spheres, 34 million polyhedra, physically accurate, and in my opinion, the CPU versus the GPU, <laughs> there is no comparison. Okay, so we always go to talks and you see people show videos, okay? Videos are nice. I showed you a little video. But here we can do one better. So this is a live simulation. We looked at the titanium project and they're having problems in getting the flow. And here we can simulate the flow live interactive. If you're designing, you're an engineer, you sit in your lab, you can use your computer to design. So this is things flowing from a silo. Uh, we have even, what you can do is you bring physical interaction. So if you're modeling something in the lab, for example, this, this, I changed the color of this uh, to mimic algae. So I don't know if you can see it in the back. But real time, live interaction, you don't need to go into the lab. You can simulate it here. And when you're happy with it and you're sure nothing bad is going to happen, then you can finally go into the lab, saving you hundreds and thousands of dollars. 
sorry, or with the current exchange rate, lots of rants. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay.